day and Monday. So last in here before we go. <clears throat> So uh, we have two two. Well, uh, let me just say that um, almost most things. Welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to begin with prayer and so looking for a volunteer. Please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you can be in class today. Uh, we're at BYU and we're grateful for uh, the opportunity that we have to learn. We're grateful for uh, Dr. Graves and ask blessed opportunities to uh, use the message here, but I hope for our minds to be receptive to the people of God. We say this in the grace of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Um, so today is the uh, last day to take the exam in the testing center. So I think all of you know that, but uh, just be aware. I don't know how lines are at the testing center. I don't know if 
They're not existent. Okay. Well, then you can just wait and wait and wait until the last uh, minute and go over. Okay. <clears throat> so, all right. Uh, I do have a handout. This is with regards to immunoassays. Uh, so uh, it uh, it uh, kind of recapitulates what was talked about in class. It gives you a little bit additional information about a couple other formats for uh, for antibody assays. But the only one that you will need to know is the ELISA assay as described in the book. So please be aware of that. Um, the others are there for your information. But it is the simple ELISA as described in the book that you will need to understand. Questions about that? This is also posted on Learning Suite. Uh, there is a special topic immunoassays, and this is the same uh, document as is posted there. All right, we are going to um, talk about carbohydrates, about sugars. And to begin with, we are going to just sort of um, learn some definitions, consider some uh, nomenclature that will be relevant to describing sugar. So um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> some different terms that are used. So let me just give you a So this would be an aldose. It has four carbons, so it'd be a tetraaldose, or um, so that is would be the. But each um, sugar, or almost every sugar, has its own specific name. So this would have a name that had had been applied to it, not a systematic name, but just a name, like glucose or fructose, is a name that describes a particular structure for a particular type of sugar. You'll notice that we have uh, two chiral centers. And consequently, there will be uh, two to the nth number of stereoisomers, different non-superimposable compounds that uh, have this same general organization. They differ in their stereochemistry at these two sites. So if we have two chiral centers, that means we will have four different stereoisomers. So let me draw these out. They uh, have their own particular uh, names. So if we uh, generate the mirror image of this molecule, this is termed an enantiomer, E-N-A-N-T-I-O-T, -T, enantiomer. And yeah, I can see it. But you can have other um, <clears throat> stereoisomers of this same Sugar. And these would look as follows. This would be where you have the hydroxyl position. <clears throat> so this now would be termed, so if we consider this as our sort of um, index compound, this would be termed a diastereomer. So it's, it's not a mirror image, but a diastereomer. And likewise, there would be a second diastereomer. <clears throat> These two would be enantiomers. Okay, so again, they are mirror images one of the other. But these, <clears throat> anything in this group 
would be a diastereg or something in this group. And likewise, uh, these, these would be diastereomers of these, and these would be diastereomers of these. Okay. <clears throat> so stereoisomers, meaning they have the same general organization, but they differ in their stereochemistry of the pyrocarbons, mirror images and antiomers, non mirror images, diastereomers. Any questions about that? Uh, this is all listed both in the slides and I, in the text. So hopefully that <clears throat> uh, you can refer to that as needed. <clears throat> I want to talk about um, another term that is used. So let me go to uh, use another sugar for this. I'm going to use glucose or Okay, so let me, so we, glucose is an aldose, that is, it has an aldehyde um, on its one carbon. The number six carbon, the last carbon is not, this, this uh, carbon is not optically active, not asymmetric. It has two hydrogens. Consequently, there is a, it, it, there, you can draw a plane to this. So uh, this is not a, a stereoisomer, but this is, this is, this is, this is. I haven't drawn in the hydrogens. These are not methyl groups, but this assumes that there's a hydrogen um, as the other, constituent on these carbons. Okay. Let me uh, point out that uh, a long time ago, a scientist by the name of Fisher, Emil Fisher, uh, solved <clears throat> the structure of these and he uh, determined a way of classifying these, the sum of the stereochemistry. He only specified stereochemistry for the next to last carbon, the last chiral carbon in this chain. And uh, he developed this nomenclature where there are D and there are L um, Fisher uh, isomers one of another. If the hydroxyl group is placed on the right, this is D. If the hydroxyl group is placed on the left, it would be L. All of the sugars that we will consider uh, as part of this class are D sugars. So it's always going to be D glucose, D fructose, D ribose, and so forth. Okay. Uh, there are occasions, very few in human, where we have L and L isomer, but we are simply going in terms of what you need to remember, everything will be D, okay? So if we consider these four centers, that means that there will be two to the fourth or 16 stereoisomers, but we're only going to consider D isomers and consequently there will only be eight that show up in the table in the book that are hexoaldoses. So hex six carbons, it ends with an aldehyde that is then Hexoaldose. This particular one with this organization is D glucose. And I've indicated on the slides, I've circled them uh, on the slides, which of the sugars structures you should know. And there are five that I would like you to, um, to remember. So glucose, mannose, galactose, fructose and ribose. So those are the five that are indicated on the, um, on the slides. Okay. I want to introduce another term. And uh, this has to do uh, with, again, different stereoisomers. And if we uh, invert the stereochemistry at one carbon. So notice that my two, the or organization of the two carbon has now been flipped. Okay, so this one 
and this one differ by uh, just the inversion of the stereochemistry of this one um, pyrrole carbon. Uh, these are called epimers, EPI, epimers, E-R-S, okay. Uh, the two epimer of glucose is mannose, D mannose. If I invert the four carbon, which is this one, that is galactose. Mannose, galactose, glucose, and fructose are by far and away, the, when ribose, are by far and away the most common sugars that we encounter in the diet and uh, in, our, in our body. So uh, anyway, so the new term is uh, ephemer. It means that you have, uh, it differs in its stereo, uh, a sugar differs in its stereochemistry of just one carbon that becomes, so glucose is the two epimer of mannose and mannose is the two epimer of glucose. Any questions about this? Again, notice that this next to last carbon is uh, the hydroxyl is shown on the right indicating that it is a D sugar. Um, I want to now talk about um, the nature of sugars in the body uh, and in nature generally. It turns out that uh, glucose and other uh, uh, six carbon sugars, including fructose, mannose, galactose, do not exist predominantly in this open elongated form. They actually spontaneously cyclize. And uh, this projection here is called the Fisher projection or the way that this is written out in its flattened elongated form is the Fisher projection. But in reality, these sugars actually undergo spontaneous reactions uh, and form cyclized sugars. This is what uh, in, in humans, in the circulation, uh, glucose is 99, approximately 99% cyclized. Only about 1% of the time is it un, uh, open up and exist in uh, a more elongated form. Fructose uh, spends a little more time in, in the open form. Maybe, so if you were to sample blood, maybe 3% of the fructose would be open uh, and not cyclized. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees. I'm just gonna lay it, on, lay it on its side. So let me redraw this now. And I'm going to position, and this is what happens spontaneously, the hydroxyl group on the five carbon near the carbonyl carbon on the one carbon. So <clears throat> this looks as follows. So here is, I'll, I'll number these in just a minute. But, Things on the right in the Fisher projection end up being projected downward as I move into what's termed the Hayward projection, which is an attempt to uh, display the cyclized form of glucose. So given that this is on the right, I'm going to position this down. Again, I'm not drawing, any, drawing in every hydrogen, but the hydrogen. This one is up. This one is down, so it's just the four hydroxyl group. And in this case, I have rotated the five hydroxyl group, and up here is the six carbon with its hydroxyl group. So if you follow me so far, I've just simply rotated this and sort of bent the, uh, the this backbone 
around on itself. Now there is a, there are lone pairs of electrons on this oxygen. So we have some uh, a sort of a negative uh, dipole, which is going to find this carbonyl carbon with its positive dipole attractive. And there is then ring closure by these electrons attacking this. This will uh, come out and uh, pick up this proton. And in the end, we actually generate another chiral center as we close the ring. So this gives rise to one of two um, stereo isomers. So one of these, so now I have a ring oxygen and I have a hydroxyl group that can be oriented up. Remember these will stay the same. But I can also have the one here. Where the hydrogen or the hydroxyl group is now oriented down. Okay, so notice that in an attempt to show the stereochemistry of this new chiral center, I can have the hydroxyl group up or the hydroxyl group down. This particular set of stereo isomers are called anomers. Okay. And we'll sometimes refer to this carbon, this uh, chiral center as the anomeric carbon. Um, and if we have the hydroxyl group oriented up in the Hayward projection, that is the beta anomer. And if we have it down, it is the alpha anomer. So again, we're still working with D glucose we have uh, sort of laid it on its side and allowed the backbone to double back on itself. And um, the 5 hydroxyl group, uh, the, the oxygen of the 5 hydroxyl group, group then attacks the carbonyl carbon, closing the ring, generating an anomeric spiral center here. And we have two possible antimers indicated as alpha with the hydroxyl down and beta with the hydroxyl up. Okay. Questions about this? Yes. Oh. That's because this is the D isomer. If you had the L isomer, the CH2OH would actually be oriented down. But this, as you rotate this, the CH2OH gets lifted, it is, is above the ring. Uh, if you have the D isomer, if you have the L isomer, it is down. It's probably easier to see this if you have three dimensional models that you can see this, but that is in fact, um, the, the, the reason that, well, this showing up here is an indication that it is indeed the D glucose isomer and not the L. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think actually about two thirds. Uh, if if you just dump glucose in the water, it will actually distribute. It, it will actually go back and forth. These are not irreversible reactions. 
So you will get ring opening. It, it doesn't spend much time in the open arrangement, but you will get a distribution of both of these. It's called muta rotation when this goes back and forth between between alpha and beta uh, anomers. And I think the beta anomer is seen about two thirds of the time and the alpha about one third of the time. In nature, uh, we will see that enzymes that are using glucose as a substrate will only use one specific anomeric orientation. That is, the binding site, the active site of the enzyme will require one specific enamor be present to be able to work with it. For example, if you are generating cellulose and you have, it will use only the beta glucose. If you're making starch, you only use the alpha anamoric glucose. Yes. Oh, sorry. So this is one, two, three, four, five, and six. And likewise, this is still one, two, three, four, five, and six. This one? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, sorry. Okay, any questions about this? This is, so this, uh, <clears throat> this process, as mentioned, happens spontaneously, but as part of enzymatic reactions, sometimes the rings are enzymatically open to allow for additional reactions to take place. If we are using glucose as a component, as a substrate for an enzymatic reaction, usually the enzyme will only be able to use one of the anomeric forms of D glucose or D nanos or D lactose. Questions? Yes. Sorry, I missed one. I well, uh, not in nature. Okay, but in the laboratory, if you put if you generate a solution of glucose and allow it to distribute between the two anomeric forms. I have my remember my if I'm remembering right, the beta is found about two thirds of the time and the alpha confirmation is somewhat less stable and is seen only a third of the time. But that's not a marked difference. It's a slight preference and that would have to do with spirits. So positioning of hydroxyl groups relative to, to the ring. So, yeah. Yes. Any of those five? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, let me. Let's see. Let me go to the slides and. Uh, Okay, so uh, we've talked about nomenclature. So I won't belabor that. Uh, this sort of displays Fisher projection. And then you can see there is an attempt to, uh, with these perspective models, to allow you to see. So, uh, oops. So you can see that the placement of the hydroxyl group on the right in, uh, in the Fisher projection is an indication of the D um, stereoisomer. And if it were on the left, it would end up being the L isomer. These are not superimposable because of the stereochemistry uh, of the chiral carbon, these cannot be superimposed one on the other by simply rotating or moving them about. 
Okay, as mentioned, here are the Alamos. As you can see, these are there are many of them, but notice that each of these has its own name. So uh, here's down here is our glucose. Here's mannose, the lactose, ribose is a five carbon aldose, so a penta aldose. Um, the only ketose, well, we talked about ethanol, the only ketose that you need to keep track of is fructose, D fructose. It may be interesting, it may not be interesting to you, but the stereochemistry, the, the, the actual structure of fructose and glucose are really superimposable except for the position of the carbonyl. So if you look at the uh, stereochemistry of the last, well, if you just look at the bottom half of D fructose, um, it is the same as D glucose. It is simply the position of the uh, carbonyl that differentiates the two. That's a, it's a big difference, but nevertheless, uh, we there are uh, times when there's inner conversion of fructose and glucose. We will see this as part of glycolysis, and all we are doing is repositioning the carbonyl along the carbon chain. We don't have to change the stereochemistry of the other four carbons. Okay, there's a little bit of information about ring closure here. I, uh, the rings have particular names, or at least the, uh, the core ring. If it's a six membered ring with the oxygen in ring, this is called a paran. It takes its name from this uh, organic compound that is a cyclized ether. We also have furan that has uh, one fewer carbon that still represents this uh, cyclized ether. Okay, I want to talk now about. Um, I have to put another slide here. I want to talk about a concept. So let me go back to the board here for a second. This concept is called reducing sugars. We will hear, you will hear this term used, and it probably needs some explanation as to what's being talked about. This term actually arises due to um, the experimental use of glucose, fructose, mannose, the lactose. It turns out that uh, a long time ago, maybe the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was that uh, people recognized uh, diabetes as a disease. The diagnosis involved a physician tasting a patient's urine to see if it was sweet. Now I have a feeling that this got old very quickly. And as a consequence, ex uh, there were experimental approaches developed to try to identify glucose or fructose in a patient's urine. And this was accomplished eventually by a chemical reaction in which, let's say we have some sugar and it is reacted with transition metals. So commonly copper two or iron three. And this reaction will require two of these uh, and we will undergo a two electron oxidation of this to form the carboxylate and a reduction of the metals, the two copies of copper one or two copies of iron two. 
the color of these is sufficiently different that using a spectrometer, just a visible spectrometer, you can quantitate the amount of uh, copper one or copper two. Copper two is blue in solution. Copper one is colorless. Uh, iron three is red and iron uh, two has a different color. Anyway, you, they have different absorbances and you can track the reaction based on how extensive the reaction is it will tell you how much sugar is there. Because of this ability to react with these transition metals and bring about their reduction, sugars, these sugars then are called reducing sugars. So if you have a free car, uh, if you have a free aldehyde, it can undergo this, it can be oxidized as you reduce transition metals Consequently, the term reducing sugars. Now, where this comes into play is that if you take a cyclized sugar, okay, uh, we'll just not specify all of the hydroxyls, but as long as it's in this, as long as we have this hydroxyl group here, unmodified, it can open and close. The ring can open and close. And if the ring can open, it can participate in this reaction. However, um, so this is called a hemiacetal. This is the term used to describe this arrangement. But if I modify this right, chemically, enzymatically, such that I replace the hydrogen with any other group, this hemiacetal is now converted into an acetal. So what, well, the so point of this is that the acetal is much more stable than the hemiacetal and the ring will not open. Consequently, it cannot participate in this reaction and it is no longer a reducing sugar. So we will talk about reducing and non-reducing sugars. Um, the reducing sugars are those that are modified, have a modified hydro, uh, anomeric hydroxyl. And, uh, and the reducing ones have the anomeric hydroxyl. OK, let's stop here. Questions? Yes. No, it has to do whether this hydroxy group is unmodified, has a hydrogen here, or whether it has some other uh, other atom bound to it. So a carbon, nitrogen, so forth. Did I clarify that here? So this is a, if this is a hydroxyl, then this is a hemiacetal, meaning that. I, it will open. If I modify this such that I have a carbon attached, then I have an acetal. This is more stable. The ring is more stable. The sugar's ring will not open uh, up and consequently it will not participate in this reaction. This reaction is a laboratory reaction. It was developed to spare physicians having to face the urine of their patients. And so, um, so we are blessed with uh, to have this. Yes. That's correct. Well, I don't know for the majority, but yeah, probably so. Uh, the problem with a um, so with a diabetic, they're unable to utilize the glucose that they take in. They'll absorb it. It will. It will get into their bloodstream, but it can't get into their cells. Consequently, they will build up high levels of glucose in their blood. As the blood circulates through the kidney, glucose is small, it's polar, it will, it will pass through the glomerulus, 
into the renal tubule and the, uh, it will be removed, it will come out in the urine. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of free sugar that will enter the urine in a diabetic, not so much in a normal individual. Yes? How often do sugar become gas it, it, it turns out that it happens with a fair amount of regularity and it also happens in nature. So um, let me go to the slides. I think we're sort of at the point where we can talk about polymers, oops, uh, polymers of uh, So anyway, this slide simply indicates that glucose can be modified into a lot of different compounds. Um, but this, this slide touches on this idea of a reducing sugar, its ability to undergo oxidation, and, con and in consequence of that, reduce transition metals with a change of color that can be used to quantitate the amount of sugar in his blood. Okay, so there are actually several common uh, disaccharides that occur in nature. We, so sucrose is just table sugar, but it is a disaccharide. Two sugars linked together through their anomeric carbon, through the anomeric carbon of one, and usually the fourth carbon, a hydroxyl group over here, this will link with this. And uh, depending on what the combination is, uh, they form different disaccharides. Sucrose, table sugar, is a combination of D glucose and D fructose. Okay. We'll, see, we'll see a picture of this uh, in a minute. Lactose, we, we hear about lactose, lactose intolerance in a milk sugar. Uh, it represents a, a combination of two sugars, the lactose and glucose. We also have maltose. If you've ever had a malted milk or malt at the uh, malt shop, uh, they add in this sugar that has a distinctive taste. It's sweet, but not nearly as sweet as glucose or fructose, but it does have this distinctive flavor that uh, uh, gives the malt a, a special taste. These sugars cannot be absorbed from the diet unless they are broken down enzymatically into individual sugars, monosaccharides. Only monosaccharides can be absorbed by the, you know, through the gut in place into the circulation. Consequently, if we eat any of these, we need to have the appropriate enzyme present to be able to break these down and allow for the absorption of the individual monomeric species that make up these disaccharides. Okay, there is a systematic way for naming disaccharides that we will go into. I don't know that we will uh, have a lot of time to do this today, but we will come back and touch on this again next time. But what you do, so here we are, look at maltose on the screen. You can see that we have, in this case, two copies, two copies of our uh, glucose. So here's one on the shown here on the left, another one here on the right. Both of these are uh, glucose molecules, but you'll notice something that's a different about the two glucose molecules. They have a different anomeric orientation. So on the left, we see this alpha referring to the alpha anomer. Uh, and on the one on the right, we have the beta anomer. So notice this hydroxyl group is oriented up in the Hayward projection. 
here it is oriented down. So that is what distinguishes these two. These are coupled together by enzyme reactions in plants. Okay, so this is not something that would happen. Uh, this, I mean, these, these sugars don't come together spontaneously to form these disaccharides. These are the products of enzymatic steps. But we're going to have this hydroxyl group here and the four hydroxyl group here undergo a condensation. Condensations result in the production of water as one of the two products. The other product in this case is this disaccharide maltose. And we have the hydroxyl group oriented down and the four hydroxyl group is already oriented down as part of D glucose. Are there questions about this? So the condensation then is enzymatically driven and we end up with this by saccharin. So let me pose the question to you. Which of these is non-reducing and how do you know that? And which of these is a reducing sugar? And how do you know that after they have been linked together? Yes. So the beta D glucose is actually. If we look at the bottom figure here of the disaccharide, notice that this one is still a hydroxyl group. That makes sense? Okay, it still has that hydrogen on the oxygen, which means that this ring on the right, circle here, will still open and close. And as a consequence, if it's able to uh, reassume its aldehyde form, that is considered to be a reducing sugar. Notice though that the alpha hydroxyl group is no longer a hydroxyl group. It is now carbon, so you have carbon here, oxygen here, carbon. So this sugar is now an acetal because we have removed the hydroxyl or replaced the hydroxyl with this four carbon of the second sugar. So this ring on the left is considered to be a non-reducing ring because it will not open. It is stable, more stable than the hemiacetal. So the hemiacetal is what we have on the right. It opens, doesn't open a lot, but it still opens and hence it's considered to be a reducing sugar, whereas the one on the left is non-reducing. Yes. So this reaction still happens in the both alpha D glucose. Does it make a difference? That's not correct. Yeah, it could. You'd have to have an enzyme that puts the two together. Well, just put on, put on the right side. If it's alpha, that wouldn't really have any effect on the concentration of the It would be. It. It would. It. It wouldn't seem to. But if you are, if you have. Um, this enzyme is synthesizing maltose. It's going to look for one copy of the alpha and one copy of the beta. And so if you have only alpha, it wouldn't be able to link the two together. Some other enzyme may be able to do that, but uh, whatever generates maltose would not. Any questions about this? I think we're gonna leave it here. We'll come back and do some naming uh, of these next time, but I think we'll stop here. Let me uh, move this story forward. I mentioned that uh, my senior year in college, I had been accepted to a graduate program. I had a student, student deferment, which meant that I was not going to be conscripted by the military for, uh, for uh, military service until after my graduation. I had assumed that uh, this would continue if I were in med, uh, in uh, graduate school, but I would continue to have a student deferment as long as I was a student in good standing. 
But that turned out not to be the case. I was told by my draft board that this only applied to undergraduate education, graduate schools, medical schools, so forth, were not given deferments. And I began looking at alternative ways of fulfilling my military obligation, but allowing me to go to school. And I looked at National Guard units and reserve units and found that they have long waiting lists. Actually, the waiting lists were not necessarily very long, but they represented two or three years of, uh, of what they expected in terms of turnover of current personnel in their units. Well, one day as I was uh, going home from school, I, I happened to go a different way and I went by what was clearly a military building. It had barbed wire fences all around it and camouflage trucks and so forth. And so I hadn't been to this particular one, but I thought I, you know, I should at least give it a try. And so I went, I think there were maybe two or three different units that shared the same building. Uh, for their training purposes. And I went to two different offices and got the same story about waiting lists until I went to this one. And I walked in and I just said, I'm just curious to know how long your waiting list is uh, uh, for you know being uh, being able to join your unit. And the sergeant at the desk said, well, we don't have a waiting list. In fact, we have many open positions. We just got orders to increase the size of our unit by 100 people. And this completely wiped out the waiting list. And we have uh, several open positions if you are interested. And uh, I fought a minute, and then I signed up. <laughs> Uh, it meant that I was going to have to go do some training, some active training, uh, basic training, advanced training. And, and I was going to have to do that uh, prior to my finishing the term. Um, and so I was a bit concerned about this, but it was close enough to the end of the term that I thought maybe my instructors would work with me to allow me to finish early and be able to leave for basic training. So I signed up with the 19th Special Forces, Company C, 19th Special Forces. Uh, this was a radio unit. Uh, these were people who uh, operated fairly large uh, radios. They did uh, Morris code, you know, so, you know, uh, and that is how they communicated over these radios. They were not usually voice radio transmissions, but Morris code. And some of these were in permanent installations, and some of these were in large trucks that had the truck back converted into the sort of mobile radio unit. So I signed up, I talked to my professors. They were agreeable, they understood the difficulty of my situation. They made arrangements for me to be able to take my final exams early. I did that. And then I went off to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, to do my basic training. And I was also going to do my advanced specialized training there as well. They have a radio school on base at Fort Jackson. And I'll tell you all about that next time. Thank you very much. Good luck on the exam if you haven't taken it. Um,